So before we get into this, um, I've got the the uh, slideshow in uh, PDF format uh, at the link shown on the screen. I also have three PCAPs that are making their debut today uh, that I uh, um, will be reviewing for this presentation. So for this presentation, we're going to be talking about keeping analysts motivated. And one of the ways to do that is to examine commodity malware. Uh, and examining commodity malware, you have to have some sort of a lab environment to do that effectively. And when you generate traffic and save it in a PCAP format, you would like to share that. You need to sanitize that to hide the details of your lab environment. And then the bulk of the presentation will be three examples of traffic uh, that we'll quickly review. So if your network is adequately protected, you're not going to see a lot of this commodity malware. Uh, really, it only takes one example to get through. But uh, your spam filters, your um, uh, if you've got any sort of web security gateway that you're using to block malicious web traffic, there are lots of examples out there that never get it, get, uh, make their way into a properly defended network. Now, if you've got a team of analysts or if you've got people that are doing that analyst function, uh, reviewing suspicious traffic uh, or reviewing suspicious alerts, near real-time detection and analysis, if you're network is adequately protected, they're not going to see a lot of that. And as a result, I've worked on teams where people get a little complacent, people get a little bored because you're seeing the same types of alerts day after day after day, and they're not really interesting. So how do you keep your people uh, who are doing this, this sort of analysis, how do you keep them motivated? How do you keep them interested in what we're doing? You can have active defense or threat hunting missions where a, a systematic search of your network in ways that your, uh, your uh, security systems do not normally detect. So that's one way. I've heard it called active defense. I've heard it called threat hunting. Uh, that's one way of trying to keep your analysts motivated. Another way is to explore to train in related areas. Some people uh, will work on the red team side, we'll work on the pen testing side, the attacker side, to try and get an idea of how that all works, which really feeds back into that defensive mindset, because if you know how an attacker thinks, you can better adequately uh, analyze, detect, and defend your network. Or you can do forensic type activities, uh, uh, which is where commodity malware comes in. Examining commodity malware. Now, commodity malware um, is commonly seen malware sent using mass distribution campaigns. This is the type of stuff we'll see on a day-to-day -day basis. This is the type of stuff that you'll see in your spam filters, in your uh, um, uh, blocked URLs, or any sort of web filtering that you have. And it offers an opportunity for you to generate and review infection traffic infection traffic that you normally would not see on a day-to-day -day basis if you're, uh, when you're protecting your networks, when you're analyzing the suspicious events in your networks. Now, the thing is that the techniques that we see in mass distribution campaigns pushing commodity malware are generally used in targeted attacks. I don't like the term APT uh, uh, because it's a media uh, buzzword. Uh, either somebody is targeting your network or you're happening to, you're happening to get carpet bombed by uh, some mass distribution campaign and something somehow finds its way in. But in order to look at commodity malware, you need to have a lab environment. And it, uh, this is lab environment where basically you have a Windows machine that you're running the malware on to see what happens. Here's kind of the setup that I have, whether it's virtual or whether it's physical. And uh, in the past year or two, the past year or so, I've taken to uh, 
including a domain controller uh, just to see what malware, certain types of malware does when it infects a client to see if it tries to move laterally or tries to move over to the domain controller. But Security Onion, uh, the reason I haven't read there is uh, uh, not necessarily to emphasize the importance of it because sometimes um, on that gate PC is where I will record the traffic and not live monitor with Security Onion, but I'll use TCP replay on Security Onion to review the traffic. If I use TCP replay, I could usually uh, use the option that uh, plays it back as fast as it can, so I won't have to wait. Uh, for example, one of the PCAPs that I have here today was recorded uh, well over eight hours. I, I actually, I think it uh, may have been closer to 24. But in these PCAPs, I have to sanitize them before I share them because I do not want to share the details of my network. If in your networks that you're protecting, if you have some information, a, uh, a recording of the traffic, a PCAP of the traffic that you would like to share, you would definitely want to sanitize that as well. Now, there are different ways to sanitize PCAPs. You've got tools like Trace Wrangler that uh, you could use to sanitize the PCAP, or you could use uh, a hex editor, which is what I prefer to use. With a hex editor, you've got a lot more um, uh, individual control. <coughs> My favorite hex editor is one that's uh, used in Debian-based uh, distros, Linux distros like Ubuntu, or Ubuntu-based distros like Security Onion. Just uh, sudo apt get install bless. Bless is the hex editor that I generally prefer to use. So what am I changing in the PCAPs? I'm usually uh, uh, using uh, the hexadecimal search and replace for MAC addresses, uh, IP addresses, using the text search and replace for host names. And it's really interesting. In NetBIOS uh, name service, NBNS traffic, uh, the host names are not, uh, they don't really correspond to any sort of normal uh, a hexadecimal pattern breakout. Um, you got to use some tricks to actually replace those host names. So now we get to the bulk of this presentation, which are examples of infection traffic. Now, for these examples of infection traffic, I use a, uh, a Wireshark, which is how most people generally look at uh, uh, PCAPs if you want to examine them. Uh, as long as they're small enough, because you get multi-gigabyte PCAPs, uh, Wireshark is going to uh, bog down and uh, uh, be so sluggish that it won't work or possibly crash. But the PCAPs I generally work with are well under the size limit to where you can, uh, where you can examine the traffic. And uh, so I use a customized column display because of the default column display in Wireshark is not ideal in my opinion, for the type of analysis that we do. So uh, if you're looking at security especially, uh, uh, you can uh, search for this on the Malware Traffic Analysis website. Uh, I've got uh, a couple of uh, older blog posts that uh, describe this, but they got links to the new one that I have posted with my current employer. So let's look at three PCAPs that I have uh, specifically presented for today's presentation. First, we're going to look at TrickBot, then Emotet, and then a, fa a fake flash update. So let's start with the TrickBot first. Here's a typical TrickBot infection chain. So you have a, a uh, email, malicious spam, and it usually has an attached office doc, a Word document, or an Excel spreadsheet where you have to enable the macros, and then that will download and install TrickBot, and then TrickBot itself uh, will download additional modules where it does all sorts of stuff. This PCAP, if anyone's following along, is um, it, it's, uh, the domain is joybridge.org. It's on 172.16.5. In that slash 24 segment, the domain controller is on dot five and the infected Windows host is on .216. Now note, I also use uh, Security Onion. 
I also use Security Onion, and uh, the alerts that I'll have here for uh, this presentation, I've used the Snort Subscriber, actually the registered rule set, and the uh, Emerging Threats Open rule set. And you can set Security Onion up to do that for our two uh, major sources of Snort types alerts for, uh, for Security Onion. So I'll generally use Suricata, but uh, you can use Snort on this as well. And these are the types of alerts that we are see uh, that we see on this PCAT. These are not definitely not all the alerts, but this is a, a few of the more significant ones that I found when I ran this TrickBot PCAP through Security Onion. First, we saw suspicious or malicious uh, uh, certificates for SSL TLS traffic on TCP ports 443 and 447. Those are the alerts. There were also some malicious uh, certificates on TCP port 449. You have uh, Windows executable files sent in response to HTTP GET requests for image files, for PNG image files. And then you have suspicious TCP port 445 traffic uh, with Windows executable sent over SMB from the infected Windows client to the domain controller. So in this case, this PCAP is where TrickBot spreads from the infected Windows host to the Windows domain controller. Now on these, I'm generally running uh, Windows 7. And uh, uh, for the domain controller, I'm running a, a Windows Server uh, 2008 R2. So if you go into Wireshark and uh, uh, assuming that you have everything set up uh, in, a, uh, in the column display that I generally tend to use, uh, you can use this Wireshark filter to filter out uh, um, the UDP port 1900 stuff is SSDP, which is related to Microsoft Plug and Play. I've never seen that relate to anything uh, um, uh, malware related, so I'll filter that out. But I'll look at the HTTP requests for the HTTP traffic, and I will look at the, uh, um, the HTTPS server names. Now you'll notice that uh, on this display, if you can see it, there are the, um, the SSL traffic, TLS traffic to over TCP port 449447. Now Wireshark doesn't automatically uh, decode that information for you, so you actually have to decode those TCP ports as SSL traffic in Wireshark which if you use the analyze to code as menu, you can set it up. In this case, I've got TCP port 447, TCP port 449, TCP port 9001, 9003, 9100, and uh, in this case, 55554. Which gives you something a little like this when you're looking through. Now that very first HTTP request uh, for erst.ock returns a Windows executable file, and that's a TrickBot executable. And then you have an IP address check, and then you see the TLS SSL traffic that is going to TCP ports 447 and 449 uh, with the occasional IP address check in there. So interesting thing with the HTTPS server, you can see on an actual domain like IP, api.ipfi.org, how that will show up as an HTTPS server name if you've got that column shown in Wireshark. However, um, if you're going directly to an IP address, you're not going to have a domain name show up there. In HTTP traffic, when you're looking at an HTTP host, if you go into an IP address, that will show up as a separate field. So you will always see an IP address in the HTTP host, but you will never see an IP address as an HTTPS server name. Now the very first category alerts that I was talking about earlier was the uh, malicious or suspicious SSL TLS certificates 
in uh, the uh, traffic to TCP port uh, 449, TCP port 447. If you filter on SSL handshake type equals 11 or 11, and you go through and look at the certificate information in the Wireshark, uh, the, the center panel that has the uh, frame details, work your way down from the certificate data all the way down to the issuer, and you will find some interesting information. You will find, in this case, you'll see a lot of internet widgets. PTYLTD is the company name. You'll see stuff like example.com. In this case, the uh, state or province name is some state. And I like to think of that state as state of denial. Because <laughs> they're denying that this is any sort of uh, legitimate or respectable SSL certificate. Now, the, the second type of uh, issue that we saw with the alerts was HTTP requests for image files returning Windows executables. So you can use a filter like HTTP and IP contains .png to look at the HTTP GET requests. And you'll see uh, for radiance.png, table.png, worming.png, all going to the same IP address. And that IP address changes generally every 24 hours. If you're to follow, select any one of those HTTP requests and follow the TCP stream, you will find that it is indeed a Windows executable. You'll see the telltale signs. Uh, the, the biggest one, the biggest two are the first two uh, ASCII characters of the first two bytes of a Windows executable are always MZ. And then usually you will have something that says along the lines of this program cannot be run in DOS mode. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be there, and that's not the only phrase that's used, but it's the most common. Now in the PCAP, we can export these Windows executables. And uh, if you are actually doing that on a Windows host, please be very, very careful. Which is why I prefer to work on Linux or a Mac uh, when I'm looking at PCAPs, especially anything like this where there's a Windows executable. If you're uh, sitting on a Windows 10 laptop right now and uh, you very well may have those PCAPs uh, deleted because Windows will be detecting malware in there. But you can export HTTP objects, and you can find uh, not only those uh, uh, Windows executables uh, that are that are uh, presented as image files. You'll find the very first one that was the uh, initial trick by executable. Now, interesting thing here: if you look at this HTTP export object list where it says the content type. That content type is what, the, uh, is what the server is identifying it as it returns the malware, right? In the first case, the server didn't identify it as anything. In the second case, uh, the server actually identified it as an image slash PNG file, which is just uh, another uh, method that malware authors use to try and slip the malware uh, through. Now in this case as well, we saw alerts on TCP traffic over uh, uh, port 445 uh, related to an internal blue style exploit and uh, the fact that there was a Windows executable sent over SMB. We can export in this case uh, the associated Windows executables by uh, file export objects, SMB. And there you will see two Windows executables uh, uh, related to the TrickBot infection being sent over to the domain controller on 172.16.5.5. And one more thing that wasn't included uh, in the uh, alert list that I didn't include, but I did see a lot of, was uh, Tor traffic. So this is an example of what Tor traffic looks like in Wireshark. You're going to see a lot of different IP addresses, and you're going to see a lot of different TCP ports. 
In this case, we saw a lot of TCP port 9001, and the server name shows as www.stringofcharacters.com. So if you see anything like this and you think, oh, it's some sort of DGA type traffic, no, no, it's uh, uh, Tor traffic. So let's look uh, at an example of Emotet. Now Emotet, who, who here is familiar with Emotet? Or Fiodo, as it's uh, also called. Well, that is something that we see on every weekday. Uh, on a basis when the campaign is active. Unfortunately, when I was generating traffic for this presentation, uh, Emotet had stopped about, uh, it wasn't this past Monday, but the Monday before that. Almost two weeks now, Emotet has been silent, as in not pushing out any new uh, uh, emails. So when Emotet is active, this is the type of infection chain that we'll see. It will always start with an email. The email will either have a web link or it will have a direct uh, Word document directly attached to the email. Sometimes we've seen things like it will have a PDF file attached to the email that has a web link that downloads the uh, Word document. But you have to enable macros and it will install Emotet on your computer, which is known as a banking Trojan. Uh, but in, uh, for the past year, it has consistently delivered follow-up malware. Anytime there is an active Emotet campaign going on, there is almost always some sort of follow-up malware. Whether it's a spammer that spams out more Emotet, uh, we've seen Iced ID or uh, Zeus Panda Banker uh, banking Trojans, and uh, more recently, before it disappeared, uh, I'd have been consistently getting TrickBot as the follow-up malware. Here are the details of the second PCAP. The domain is riddlehouse.net. And in this case, it's in the uh, Class C non-routable network, 192.168.1.0/24. These are the types of alerts that I got. What you'll notice is that there are no alerts on here uh, for the ICE ID banking Trojan. If you were to look at the Emerging Threats Pro rule set, or if you were to look at the, uh, uh, the SNORT actual subscriber rule set, as opposed to the register rule set, you might see some more up-to-date signatures um, that would include ICE ID banking Trojan, uh, or um, stuff that says specifically Emotet. In here, we've got some of the Emerging Threats rules that say Fiodo Tracker, and Fiodo is another name for Emotet. Once again, if you look at the PCAP, using this particular Wireshark filter, you'll see a lot of HTTP and some HTTPS traffic. So that's a little bit hard to look at, so let's uh, kind of break this down a little more clear. For the Emotet traffic, the first HTTP request returns the Word document. Now these Word documents, when you enable the macros, they have five domains that they can grab the Emotet malware binary from, in case any one of those domains is bad, or, or uh, I should say gets caught and is taken offline. So in this case, you've got that dodo.cl, which is the initial Word document, then you got uh, mobilemohammed.com, uh, which was suspended, kersey.shop, and uh, kroha-vana.ru, which uh, also, uh, if you look at them, uh, return 404 not found errors. And finally, the fourth domain in that macro, uh, carpl.info.pl, returns the Emotet malware binary. And then you've got uh, two HTTP requests to uh, .quadded IP addresses that are the Emotet post-infection traffic. That's command and control traffic, and it also uh, is used to send follow-up malware. But it's, it's encrypted or encoded, so you won't actually be able to get the follow-up malware from your PCAP. This is the ICE ID banking Trojan post-infection traffic. So you've got uh, HTTPS traffic to uh, hulatech.com and abopeer.com, and you've got some HTTP uh, get requests over TCP port 80 that uh, um, 
are distinctively iced ID. But once again, like we could with the TrickBot PCAP, we can export HTTP objects and we can uh, get both the uh, Emotet Word document and we can get the Emotet malware binary, even if we can't get the follow-up malware. Now, one thing with Emotet is it generally tends to uh, not hide as much. Uh, so the Word document is identified by the server when it returns it as application slash MS Word. The uh, Emotet malware binary is uh, shown as an application slash XMS download. So let's look at the third PCAP. This is a fake flash update. Now recently, uh, about two weeks ago, within the last week or two, uh, published an article with my employer, a blog post about this particular one. Um, so it's a fake flash updater that actually uh, has windows that come up that make you think it's an actual flash installer. So it's a little clever and it literally updates your flash. In this case, it updated the ActiveX plugin uh, in, the, uh, in my uh, uh, Internet Explorer browser. But then it dumped just a bunch of other uh, programs that I would never install on my real computer in a million years and a cryptocurrency miner, which uh, seems to be the big, uh, big thing, a lot of media and uh, people, for some reason, pay attention to cryptocurrency miners more than some of this other unwanted programs or adware. So the domain in this third PCAP is raventronics.com on 10.1.100. So there are other alerts here, but I want to focus on the cryptocurrency miner because it is interesting traffic. You will see in this case, um, with these fake flash updates, they generally don't take uh, uh, too much time to actually hide their uh, follow-up adware, for lack of a better term. A lot of people will call it malware. I've seen it referred to as PUP, potentially one of unwanted programs, or PUA, potentially unwanted applications. I think if you're a uh, former Air Force like I am, you tend to per use the word PUP. If you're former Army, you tend to like to use the word PUA. So the PCAP begins with a URL to an Amazon AWS server that uh, provides the flash, the initial fake flash updater. If you're to look at this, this uh, PCAP, using a standard Wireshark filter that I've shown the, site the previous two times. You'll see a lot of HTTP uh, requests to osdsoft.com. And uh, that domain is associated with a lot of unwanted programs and also associated with fake flash updates. So that's one you can probably safely ignore and block. So if you try in this uh, particular PCAP to uh, filter on HTTP requests, that's a typo that should, <laughs> I misspelled HTTP uh, dot request, and IP contains dot .exe, you'll see uh, several requests uh, that include dot .exe in the URL. Unfortunately, uh, those requests to adobe.com or macromedia are not uh, actual Windows executables. The only Windows executables you see are the adware unwanted programs from osdsoft.com and the uh, hardware cdn.net. So with the initial fake flash updater, you will see uh, other executables sent from osdsoft.com. The actual flash update is uh, sent over HTTPS from fpdownload.adobe.com. And here's some other stuff. I gotta get through this here pretty quickly. You can go ahead and export HTTP object list and you will find the associated executables. And the traffic on TCP port 144444. Uh, if you look at the DNS query right before that, you'll see that it leads to a, um, a crypto coin mining pool. 
for XMR, which is XM Rig, which is a Monero cryptocurrency miner. Follow the TCP stream for that. You will see typical Monero mining traffic, if you've seen that before. And that really is it. We talked about keeping security analysts motivated, how commodity malware is a way of doing that. Um, a lab environment and sanitizing PCAP files for uh, looking at the commodity malware and sharing the traffic. And then three examples of infection traffic. I know this is a little quick. Um, by uh, uh, going to the malware traffic analysis blog, you can get uh, examples of those PCAPs and this uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, slideshow in PDF format to review those uh, with a little more leisure time. Does anybody have any questions? I will be around for the rest of the conference. So if anybody does have any questions, they want to uh, ask me anything more in detail, I'll be more than happy to answer. Sir. Yes, the question was sanitizing PCAP files. What exactly does that mean? Uh, um, it is replacing information uh, like MAC addresses, IP addresses that would uniquely identify your network with other values, with other numbers, with other, uh, uh, with other values, with other bytes in that, in that file. So I'm, instead of my actual MAC address that you're seeing on the Windows host that was infected, you're seeing another one that I inserted in its place, replaced it with. Any other questions? Sir? Uh, for me it is, yes. The, is the sanitization process manual? Yes, for me it is. If you use something like Packet Wrangler, um, it, it can be a little more automated. You could just uh, run a, a couple of quick commands and do that. But for me, I'm literally going through and reviewing the PCAP and finding anything that looks like it might uh, uh, reveal information on my environment. Any other questions? If not, then thank you very much. <laughs>